when you look at the definition of the Underground Railroad, it is an act of civil disobedience. Defying the laws that denied freedom, the tracks leading to liberty for enslaved people coursing through the waters of the Ohio River. There were slave catchers on both sides of the river and in, in, uh, in the water. I can't help but to admire not only my uh, great grandfather, but all those who went back and forth across the river. Let's talk about stories of resilience and courage. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. Underground Railroad conductor Harriet Tubman said there was one of two things I had a right to liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. Welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. I'm Ashley Kirkland. Tubman was one of many conductors risking death to bring enslaved people to freedom. That struggle for liberty took place all along the Ohio River, including Ripley, Ohio. This small river community played a big role as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Why was Ripley such an abolitionist stronghold? Um, it's a question that we get asked a lot here at the Rankin House on Tours. And part of it stems from the fact that the founders of Ripley were veterans of the American Revolution. What had they done? They just fought for American freedom. And there was a, uh, a portion of those soldiers who believed everyone had the right to freedom. And so they moved to communities where they either established the community from the ground up or they gravitated toward these communities where people were, other people were working as conductors and helping all people become free. And so Ripley's reputation grew. There was a large network of men and women, black and white, that worked as conductors in Ripley, Ohio. And the town's reputation grew to such an extent that during the Civil War, Confederate officers threatened to burn Ripley to the ground and referred to Ripley as that abolitionist hellhole. So Reverend John Rankin was a Presbyterian minister and an ardent abolitionist. He called Ripley his home for 40 plus years and was the leading Underground Railroad conductor in that movement uh, during its most important years. Rankin wrote his autobiography as an older man and so we know a lot of actual facts about what went on on this site. And Rankin tells us that over about a 40 year period, he and his family aided roughly 2,000 fugitive slaves escaping through this farm setting. And although Rankin was a modest man, I believe he took a lot of pride when he wrote, I never lost a passenger, meaning fugitives in the care of this family were never caught by their owners or by bounty hunters and taken back into slavery. Fugitive slaves learned about um, Reverend Rankin's efforts as a conductor and his home here in Ripley as a safe house through what I call the, the grapevine, just word of mouth for many. Um, and they were told, if you can make it to the Ohio River around Ripley, look for the house on the hill and the light in the window. That is a home of Reverend Rankin. It's a safe house. You can come here and find shelter and this family will move you on north to your next station and on your way to Canada in freedom. Reverend John Rankin's purpose, goal, was to see that everyone was free. And it came from his religious upbringing and his background and his studies as a Presbyterian minister. Reverend Rankin believed you cannot own another human being. And he really spent a lifetime trying to put an end to the issue of slavery. There were many other conductors in Ripley, this large network, and among them was a most unusual conductor, and that was John Parker, who had been enslaved himself, was able to buy his freedom, uh, and settled in Ripley, Ohio, and worked a as a conductor. Uh, but Parker was unusual in that many times he would take his skiff and row back across the Ohio River into Kentucky and bring fugitive slaves out and then help them find their way many times up the hill 
here to Rankin House, then the Rankin family would take over and move them you know, further on. I, I believe that the residents of Ripley are very proud of the town's role in the Underground Railroad movement. And Ripley certainly stands out. Um, it kind of rises to the top in many of the communities that we're doing, where the residents were doing the same thing. Its role um, was important, you know, during that time in our history, and it's as relevant today as it was 150 years ago, because we're still fighting some of the same fights. So the story that we're telling here is so important, and so important for young people to understand um, about the history of this site and what people were willing to do to help people achieve freedom. Well, just ahead, the search for freedom told by a descendant of an enslaved person, the story of the Settles family, four generations strong in Ripley, Ohio. Welcome back. We want to share with you the story of one family's journey from slavery to freedom. Joseph Settles was a courageous Underground Railroad conductor who found freedom for his family in Brown County. Four generations later, Reverend James Settles tells how his great grandfather planted the family's roots in Ripley. Joseph Settles was a slave in northern Kentucky in the Maysville area, Maysville, Mays Lick area. Uh, he uh, married there and was uh, starting a family when the Civil War broke out. Uh, as uh, uh, things progressed, they, he and his wife had a, a baby girl in November of 1862. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in uh, January, and the uh, young lady who was running the farm at that point uh, was beginning to sell off slaves to the South. Uh, he made arrangements that uh, someone would leave a boat. Uh, so he and his wife, an uncle, the baby girl, uh, and a couple of others made their way down the hill to the river from Maysville uh, into the boat and they floated down the river uh, to Eagle Creek, uh, which is here on the edge of Ripley, uh, and then uh, let the boat go and made their way up Eagle Creek to uh, some uh, farmers that had arranged to, to hide them and, and let them live with them. Uh, a night or two later, he went back and, and got six more and brought them back across the river as well and, and took them up Eagle Creek and they, they stayed with some farmers in that area. And after the Civil War, he lived in downtown Ripley. He uh, operated a, a dray company where he would haul water for the town and to the town cistern. Uh, he hauled groceries and supplies from the wharf boat to, to the merchants in, in town, and that's uh, primarily how he, he supported his family. Uh, the family spread out a bit. Uh, we had an uncle who went to New York, uh, operated a, uh, a department store. We had an uncle who went to, uh, a great uncle to me, to uh, New York, uh, worked in the Postal Service, uh, and they all farmed, uh, those who stayed in the area. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that they were involved with. Uh, they were involved with building B.B. Chapel, the church I, I had the honor of pastoring for so long. Uh, my dad would tell me of stories that the, the, the building was started in 1893, but it was completed uh, after the turn of the century. He was born in 1902, and, and he can remember uh, his uncle sending him down the street to the hardware store for uh, a penny's worth of nails to, to continue the work. So this is home, uh, and that's what ties me here. Uh, this is a community that uh, I know that my ancestors were a part of and, and uh, helped to build. It probably wasn't uh, easy for my grandfather to get the contract to haul the water for the city, but he got it, my great-grandfather. And uh, so I have roots here, and, and uh, I do owe this town uh, something, and I hope that I've paid part of it back. They fought for freedom in faraway countries, but did not enjoy the same freedom in America. Black veterans tell their stories of sacrifice and hope when Let's Talk Cincy returns.
The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is located along the banks of the Ohio River. That area was once known as Little Africa because it was a point of entry for people of African descent who came to Cincinnati. The Freedom Center plays an important role in preserving the history of the Underground Railroad. Well, I think it's important when we talk about Underground Railroad history, we talk about the geography that takes place. Of course, the Ohio River is a very significant part of that story, uh, known as River Jordan uh, by many crossing over. Uh, but when we look at Cincinnati and we look at Ohio, keep in mind that Ohio was the first state in the Northwest Territory, which was a free territory. And so in many ways, Ohio becomes the leader in this advancement going towards West. That's why Cincinnati was looked upon as the Queen City. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is situated right here in the heart of what was once Little Africa. Approximately 40,000 would cross over through this area, and it was the people in these communities of Little Africa uh, that would help them along their way. We must understand that when we talk about that Underground Railroad, it is a story about survival. It's a story about life and death. Uh, keep it in mind that, as I stated before, these are individuals who are breaking the law. Um, after 1850, it's federal law. It is a federal law to free yourself from bondage. It is a federal law for you to be a conductor or to assist someone in their quest for freedom. And so that means that you can be prosecuted, you could be jailed, you could be fined. And for, for, for those of the black community, you could be enslaved yourself for doing the work of the Underground Railroad. People escaped in many, many different ways. Zion Baptist Church is known that one of their deacons uh, being involved in uh, an escape of 28 that escaped from uh, Boone County, Kentucky, going through the streets of Cincinnati in a mock funeral. Uh, and so he was implicit and very involved in the planning and the execution um, of that escape. There are a lot of uh, folklore and myths that are out there that comes about the Underground Railroad, but it was about being very meticulous about where you can go. Yes, I'm going to go to the house that has a candle in the window, but it also may have a, uh, a red blanket that's over, draped over the porch uh, uh, handle or something like that, that they know that this is safety. Blueprint of our forebears have been given to us, but it's up to us to uh, improve upon the design of that. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about from a contemporary standpoint, we have all this wonderful technology at our hand, but we can use that technology to be able to galvanize and motivate people to do what is right. It's important to understand that the Underground Railroad is a civil action of disobedience placing someone in bondage because of the color of their skin, what they look like, where they come from. That needs to be addressed. That needs to be uh, confronted with. And so that's what that Underground Railroad is. And so when we look at all the social justice movements that have come about, civil rights, uh, whether it is the movements of today, uh, especially after the George Floyd uh, 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 killing and murder, uh, these are all contingent back to a precursor that we call the Underground Railroad. So it's important for us to have a under, greater understanding of the stories, to have a greater understanding of the nuances that helped shape the Underground Railroad. Black service members defending the freedom enslaved people so cherished has been a part of the American story dating back to the Revolutionary War. We spoke with four local veterans from the greatest generation who shared their stories of service. My name is J.C. Battle III. I was spec four in the military service and uh, Army, U.S. Army. I've been Damon Lynch, Jr. I was in the United States Marine Corps in 1956 to 1958, and I was a PFC when I got out private first class. Horace McRae, I was in the Army, came out as a corporal. It's World War II. It's Charles O. Dillard, uh, retired as a Brigadier General. I served on the ground, so to speak, about 25 years, but 32 years for retirement. But uh, most of my time was in the Ohio and Indiana National Guard. I've been around military people most of my life, and uh, we're, they're a bunch of good people, and, and uh, we support each other. That's why we do what we do, because if we cease doing what we're doing here today, then the memories will disappear. 
and the future generations won't have any idea what went down. Today we can give, those, give honor to those who have passed on and those who are still living that to get that recognition they deserve. I was part of uh, World War II by going to Europe at the time and through the English Channel and arriving in, in two plus, D, D plus two, which was two days after D-Day. And there I was, I was uh, part of the 463rd ATC. And uh, so our duties were, at that time, just to go from the, sh from the shore to ship, pick up ammunition, what have you, bring it back to the shore. After two days of that, then I, w I was assigned, really assigned to the motor pool where I repair all the, the equipment there. While in the military, we did a lot of uh, medical teams into Argentina and Haiti and Cuba and so forth. And I continued doing that after I got out of the military and I'm still involved in that. Uh, it's been a big, it's really, I've enjoyed every minute of it and I think very highly of it. I think back and they were great days. I'm happy to see females now black females becoming higher rank, running platoons, running regiments, running whatever they run. And uh, the sad part about it, that we went through a period of, uh, they were dealing with women and they weren't getting too much favor, but now that has turned around. We have a vice president now who's a lady. So things are on the rise. And so it took a while but it's never too late. And so we build now on what they did and we keep building. Because if we don't do that, then in a sense, we have failed them who started because they were much better than we are because they had the circumstances that they were under was much different than what we are under now. So they paved the way for us, trailblazers, that's what I call them. Well, we can go all the way back to the Civil War and the uh, um, uh, uh, first, uh, first World War I. But what I would like to s say to everyone out there that they should honor all those veterans, uh, especially the Tuskegee Airmen too, and the Buffalo Soldiers, if you want to go back there, to, to honor those that you recognize as uh, veterans to say, hey, you did a great job. Let's all honor each other and make this a better world to live in. A Moment Matters. Local black leaders discuss the moment that changed their lives when Let's Talk Cincy returns. We want to hear from you. Email us your ideas at ltc at wlwt.com. And remember, you can always watch full episodes or get more information on wlwt.com slash Let's Talk Cincy and on our very local app. You can also listen to Let's Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. You know, one moment can really change your life forever. That instance can set you on a path you never imagined. A few months back, we sat down with 2022 Men of Honor honorees and each described that moment when fate intervened. I had the opportunity to, to spend time with Maynard Jackson when he was doing what he was doing in Atlanta. Uh, and spending time with him and, and uh, how he thought about things, and the way he carried himself, uh, I kind of emulated some of that. I went back and worked with and for senior management at Procter & Gamble. And I think it made a difference of how I presented myself and cleared the, kind of cleared a path for upward mobility. And it's only by moving up that you're really able to have the maximum impact to, for the maximum number of people. Uh, meeting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in person, he was in Cincinnati for uh, an event uh, at the uh, church that my uh, late father, Dr. L. V. Booth, pastored. Uh, he came to our home, and even though I was only 10, there was something about that chance meeting 
uh, that changed my life and uh, has had a rippling effect and really caused me uh, to get uh, involved deeply uh, in, the, in the civil rights movement and in the human rights uh, movement and, and uh, doing for others. One event that cemented my belief in the opportunity and the responsibility to give back and to make your community a better place was in the wake of the riots caused by the, the death of Timothy Thomas in Cincinnati years ago. I was a fairly junior manager at P&G at the time, and you know, city was in uproar, what do we do? Um, and uh, you know, John Pepper and Damon Lynch and a number of other people, I saw them come together uh, regardless of race, economic background, business background, and they said if we put our efforts together through at that time, which was the Cincinnati Can Commission, we can make a difference. Um, and I saw leaders who at the time put a lot of their own personal safety and credibility on the line to say this was a moment in which we needed to change. And that, while I'd always been active, my mom grew up in union politics, I'd always been active, that gave me new lens into how, as a business leader, I could affect change. My mother and father, they made sacrifices daily so that my sisters and I could have better opportunities. And my mother and father were married when my mother was a sophomore in college. And so she had four children, and when the youngest went to kindergarten, she went back to school, got her undergrad, got her master's, and began teaching. My father worked two jobs to ensure that we had the things that we needed and a few of the things that we wanted. And so we moved when I was 12 years old. And in our local community, there were two African-American families. And my father could have gotten an, a loan, a mortgage, in a community 15 miles south, but he paid a percentage point higher on that mortgage for the new home because he said, I want to make sure that when you kids get to that age, they will have had experience of an African-American being true to their word, paying their mortgage, and as such, you won't have to have the struggles that your mother and I had. Well, thanks for joining us. We will see you next week for another edition of Let's Talk Cincy.